Hello and welcome to episode 171 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today's episode is with Vicky. Vicky is going to share a whole bunch of different stuff with us. Her job has something to do with type 1, which is very interesting. She's tried the keto diet. She's working on her health. She's working on her weight. There's all kinds of stuff going on here. There's a little something in this one for everybody. I want to thank our sponsors, Dexcom and Omnipod. Dexcom, of course, makers of the G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor and Omnipod, the tubeless insulin pump that Arden has been using since she was four years old. We'll talk more about those later. But for now, let's jump right in with Vicki and find out what's going on. It's incredibly important to remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before being bold with anything, but especially insulin. Hi, Scott. Um, my name is Vicki, and I am a type 1 diabetic. Vicki, how are you? This is, I'm great. I'm glad you're on. Yeah. So, so you're an adult with type 1. Uh, how old were you when you were diagnosed? I was just shy of my 31st birthday. And you are how old now? I am 49. Oh, congratulations. That's very nice. Yeah. <laughs> Look at you. I'm 46, and every day I wake up, I think, I can't make it much longer, can I? <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I'm 49. Like, where, when, when did that happen? It does <laughs> feel weird, no matter what. It always feels like you're like, how is this me? We had these beautiful white flowers all over the front of our house this year, right? Um, just planted them everywhere when they were little. They got up, and they were big and bushy and really beautiful. It wasn't expensive. It made the house look great. The one problem was is that they... They're only one season flowers, and they need oh, no. they need to be pulled out. So at the end of the year, the first frost hit, frost hit, and they, they wilted a little bit. And I was like, I'm going to go get the wheelbarrow. I'm going to pull out all of these flowers from the ground. I have a place in the back. I will dump them, and this is what I will do. And then the <laughs> next day, I thought, why does my hamstring hurt so much? <laughs> all I did was bend over in a slightly odd position and pick up flowers. <laughs> That's not a thing that makes people upset, is it? But it is apparently at a certain age. So yeah, uh, yeah. I know how you feel. It sucks yeah. is what it is. <laughs> so, so when I heard from you, you sent me a, an email. Of course, you said a lot of wonderful things about the podcast because how could you not? And, and, um, but you said you were listening. I was wondering, how did you find it? Um, it's kind of been a journey for me. So I kind of, Around June, July time frame, I started this health journey. And I didn't start out listening to diabetes podcasts. I started listening to other ones. And I was so inspired by them, I thought, well, I'm going to find something about type 1. And there weren't a lot out there. And I stumbled onto yours. And I wasn't real sure I wanted to listen to it because I didn't feel like it really applied to me being a an adult. I felt like maybe it was of a caregiver type podcast. Okay. But I took but I took a listen. I took a chance and it's just it's been tremendous help for me. Oh cool. Oh well, I'm very glad about that. Something drove you to to worry about your health. You a person living with diabetes for oh, let me check my math. 31, 41, 8, 18, 7, about like 17, 18 years, right? Right, so right. I'm yeah. very good with the whole numbers and then some of the smaller <laughs> one digit numbers also. And so, um, and so what hit it? Was it just age? Like, did you start thinking I better do something or like what, what brought you to like, I want to do better with my health. Do you remember? Yeah. Well, I, you know, it's not like the whole 17, 18 years I haven't taken care of myself. I have gone through periods where I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm going to get my A1C down. I'm going to do a much better job of this. And, um, it just, I, I couldn't seem to make it work. And I, um, had a lot of things happen in my life where they were kind of life changing events. And, um, I got a job working for JDRF and I thought, you know what, if I'm going to start preaching this, I got to start, you know, 
walking the walk and taking better care of myself. I see. So you sort of, so was it more of like, did you feel a responsibility to other people at that point? Do you think? I felt a responsibility to be genuine and honest. I didn't feel like I could go into schools and help kids uh, with their 504 plans, not doing what I'm preaching. So you, you didn't want to be the person standing up at the top with the, the 9.5 A1C going, now listen to, here's what you have to do. <laughs> and, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and because it felt just disingenuous and you, you just wasn't something exactly. you were interested in feeling. Like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it yeah. occurred to you, because in this day and age, as it would, it occurred to you to find a podcast um, about it's about health. So was it more about just like right away? Was it like exercise, diet? Like, was that the way you thought about it at first? So at first it was about how am I going to make this work for me? Um, I had been on Weight Watchers. I had been, you know, worked with personal trainers. Um, it's always been about losing weight as well as being able to maintain my, my glucose, my blood glucose. And, um, it just never seemed to click. It just never seemed to work. So I'd always eaten uh, low carb in the past, and it seemed to have the best effect on being able to control my, my blood glucose. And I thought, well, I'm going to try that again. And I got turned on to a ketogenic diet, and I started learning a lot about it, especially as a type 1. I was a little bit nervous. Mm-hmm. And I um, got a book that was for uh, type 1 diabetics and ketogenic diet. And I was able to eliminate the majority of the carbs that I eat, which made it so much easier to maintain good glucose control. Okay. So you're str- you were str- when you were eating carbs, you were struggling to stop spikes and lows and all that stuff. And so... After a long time of frustration, you just were like, I'm just going to stop eating carbs because I can't get ahead of it any other way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you find it fun not eating carbs? Um, it was definitely challenging, mm-hmm. but it got easier. And the numbers on my Dexcom made it so worth it. Okay. I was just like, oh my gosh, I've got this now. This makes sense to me now. And so what do you think that was? Like when you take a guy of my guesses, but when you take away a bunch of the carbs and you're down to a few, it's not too hard to to manipulate what those carbs are doing. Is it's, you know, carbs that are with vegetables, I'm assuming, carbs that maybe a little bit of bread, not a whole lot, like that kind of stuff. Or what what did a diet look like back then? Yeah, it was most you mean before? No, when keto you switch or? to the no, when you switch to the keto diet, I know nothing about mm-hmm. it. Like what what did that okay. what does that look like? Um, less than 20 grams of carbohydrates a day with those carbs coming from leafy greens, avocados, and maybe some nuts. Okay. So absolutely no bread, no sugar, no grains, completely eliminated that from my diet. And when I started this, I, I, I went with the attitude of, this is what I'm going to do today. I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow, but this is what I'm going to do today. And I'm just going to see what happens. Did it, and it affect your overall amazing. health? Did it affect your overall health? Like aside from well, diabetes, was your, I mean, if you're like, did your weight do what it want, what you wanted it to do? Did your energy, that kind of stuff? My energy for sure. Um, not so much my weight. Mm-hmm. And so I, I just really started on like this journey and um, I, I've found some other things that have maybe played into why I wasn't losing weight, why my blood sugars were spiking when I was eating grains. You know, so it's been it's been really eye-opening for me to have the opportunity to have a clean slate, which is what keto gave me, and then now just kind of reintroducing some things into my diet, um, knowing that uh, I found out that I am gluten-sensitive, mm-hmm. so I don't have celiac but I am gluten sensitive. These are all things that I would always just blame on diabetes. And and now that I was able to kind of have that clean slate, I am really seeing what's going on in my body. And it's, it's definitely not a one size fits all. I got it. Okay. And so, so you went, but you basically broke it down to zero and started over again and, and, and you've been adding things. So are you on a strict keto diet now or would you not consider it that anymore? 
I am still on a strict keto diet. Okay. Okay. I um and I I love it. I mean, I feel better. I am starting to lose some weight. Um, I found out that I also have uh, some kind of degeneration where I don't um, absorb the B vitamins. Mm -hmm. So by taking a supplement that helps me absorb those, I think that's part of the thing that's helping me start to lose weight and helping me have more energy. I see. Do you have a thyroid? Do you have any thyroid issues? I do. I just found out that I have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Ah, So again, I had had high, yeah, (laughs) I had had uh, hypothyroidism and I had been on medications for a while, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't until recently that I found out that I actually have been diagnosed with um, Hashimoto's and Hashimoto's is an autoimmune disease, which means that your body is attacking the thyroid. So that was a little bit of an eye opener for me. That was a wake up call because now I have two autoimmune diseases. Right. And if I had to pick two, I don't know that these would be the two that I would choose. However, there's a lot worse ones out there, and I want to make sure I don't get those. So your body got tired of beating up your pancreas, and it was like, what else can we do? Uh, exactly. Her thyroid's yeah. doing nothing. And, and so yeah. what's the difference between being told you're hyperthyroid and your Hashimoto's? What's the difference between the two? From a traditional medicine perspective, I don't think much because I don't think they treat it any different. They would just give you a a synthroid, you know, Um, but from a what can I do to make sure that this doesn't continue or maybe heal it? There are some foods that I can avoid. There are some things that I can do personally that um, may help prevent any future autoimmune diseases. And so what, what foods are those and how did you learn about that? Um, for me, it was a sensitivity test and it is definitely grains. I cannot eat grains. Um, and it's interesting because a, a few months ago before I found this out, I went to my endocrinologist who is wonderful. I absolutely love her and said, do you think I can have celiac disease? Because this just doesn't work for me. What What's down on paper and how it should work and making sure that you count your carbs and it just, it doesn't seem to work for me. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, no, you you don't have celiacs. It would be different symptoms. And so I took her for her word, you know, why wouldn't I? And then, you know, come to find out doing this sensitivity testing, I do have sensitivity. doesn't mean I have celiacs, but it does mean that it affects me differently than maybe somebody else. When you have a grain, what does it do? I personally think that it um, lasts in my body. I don't know this for a fact. This is mm-hmm. just kind of How it feels my theory. Yeah, yeah it, I think that grains don't aren't absorbed in my body as quickly as they may be in somebody else. Mm-hmm. So it could be, and because I'm doing the insulin on the outside, um, I'm not hitting the mark every time. Because it's staying in your system longer or then, so the insulin's gone, but the grain's staying behind. It's still breaking down. Something. Still keeping up your blood sugar. And, okay, so let me think. Um, What was, what's the outcome of that? Is it just blood sugars or do you have other physical kind of side effects from it it, when you're having the grain? Yeah, so I was always so tired. I was always so lethargic. And, um, again, I would blame it on the type one. I would completely blame it on type one diabetes. It wasn't until I eliminated everything and saw that my blood sugars were in good control, um, that I'm like, okay, something else is going on here. So I I do think that the grains had some, something to do with that. Um, I'm also sensitive to dairy. So that's something that I haven't completely eliminated. But when I do eat it, I can I feel a little more um, swollen, like inflammation in my body. Okay. So I think that you know it's and, and this is again, Scott. This has been a complete journey for me. I I um I made a conscious decision to kind of figure out what the heck was going on and take care of myself. And I'm still learning. Do you ever feel sick to your stomach or like any of that kind of thing? Or is it not like that? Pretty rarely. Okay. Um, I I don't really get sick to my stomach too much. Gotcha. All right. So now you've described a lifestyle 
that has almost no correlation to the hey just eat it and bolus attitude of my podcast so mm-hmm. <laughs> how did you, what about the podcast hit you then because i could easily see you listening to this and being like ah, this isn't what i do but something about this is helping you so what what, what was it now because i'm incredibly interested at this point like yeah you know what i mean you, you see what i'm saying right like there's no there's no reason to come in being like, I'm keto and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And this guy's talking about, you know, if we bolus here, you can eat corn pops. So Mm -hmm. like, how how has it been valuable for you? I think a couple things. Um, The first one in, in my profession and what I do, it has been incredibly valuable for me in how I guide families along, especially newly diagnosed families, because I do not expect for a teenager or a small child to start eating keto by, by any means. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know that I'm going to for the rest of my life, you know, but, um, I, I do think that I I try to tell everyone, especially, you know, families that are newly diagnosed that are struggling and quite honestly have been given advice of, well, unless they're over 300, don't treat when they're in school. And I'm just, I'm just shocked by that because I, I know how I feel when I'm 300 and I sure as heck wouldn't be in any kind of learning mode in my brain, you know? And so, um, that, so that was one angle of it. But for me personally, it was being bold. It was having the, being given permission to just try it. And I still have spikes. Um, I still have a few lows. Um, there, I'm I'm realizing that some of the proteins actually affect my blood sugar, especially for me personally. Chicken, I have to bolus for chicken. Oh, no kidding. And yeah, and so I, I feel like you gave me permission to be bold. Oh. And what's the worst thing that's going to happen? I'm going to go low, and I'm going to pop a glucose tab. Nice. I'm so glad. <laughs> that, that's amazing because, um, well, let me think about how I would how I would say this to you. And I'm typing to Arden about her blood sugar at the same time. Hold on one second. <laughs> um, so it's cool because you talked about a journey, right? Like about trying to figure this thing out and and you know figuring out why your your health isn't where you want it to be and. And nobody's really helping to the point in as much as that some, you don't walk into a doctor's office and somebody doesn't look at you and go, oh, my God, it's this thing. Do this. And it just right. and it fixes it. Right. So I think that I think that when I think about how what everything that led us to you and I talking today or me talking to the last person I spoke to or whatever it ends up being, it was just so similar. It was I was lost. I didn't know what to do. And I started a bog. And I'm writing in this blog and it's great. And blogs were the way things were done back then. And, you know, it just, I saw it help people. But then at some point I was like, it's not helping enough. Like, it's just, it's making people feel not alone, which I think is really valuable and really great. But then what's left? Like, I, I know I said to you privately recently, you know, when you find out you're not alone, it's an incredible sense of calm and it really does help. It does help to know somebody else has been through this. It helps to know that they've been through it and they've succeeded, that it hasn't killed them, like, you know, hasn't made them crazy. But then you go home and it's, you know, four o'clock in the morning and your blood sugar is 65. You are now alone. (laughs) You you know, like, like the the memory of all the other people who have been low at four o'clock are nice, but, but they don't help you get your blood sugar back up without it going to 300. It doesn't help you the next night, not get back to 65 again. Like it lacks all of the 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 rest of the sentence like i always think we talk i always think about how people speak in sort of platitudes you know like i wrote about it recently i actually wrote about it in my book years ago like it really is something that sticks with me the idea of like i remember my mom saying to me like marriage is hard and i remember being an adult and thinking like why didn't she finish that sentence like mm-hmm. like marriage is hard and here's what i should have done here's what i could have done here's what would have been better if this happened you know uh, wait till you see, you know, people say that all the time when you have a kid, Oh, wait till you see, wait till I see what, tell me, why is it a secret? <laughs> it, 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 you know, like, and so we do that with diabetes all the time. It's like, well, this is so obviously like that. And then there's more, but nobody says more. And I just thought, well, this is what this should be. Like, it should be saying the rest of it. 
you, you, you know you know what I mean like let's say the rest of it and right. what and what's holding people back and I, I paid attention for years and the best that, it, that that I could make sense of is that people are afraid of their insulin and and Absolutely. I think that's the core of what happens I'm gonna read the definition of fear an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that something or someone is dangerous likely to cause pain or a threat Most of what we talk about here on the podcast revolves around not being afraid of your insulin, being able to make bold decisions about your boluses and your basal rates, keeping spikes away, keeping lows away. It's all really about not being afraid. Luckily for us, there's a tool that can help us to not be afraid. When I realized years ago that it was my fear that was holding me back from making better decisions for my daughter's health, You've heard me tell that story, right? Where Arden was upstairs and I told her to bolus through a text message because I could see what her blood sugar was on her CGM through our share feature. And then I realized I don't need to be afraid anymore. It doesn't matter where Arden is. I can always see what's happening. When I got over that fear, it was a huge turning point in Arden's life and in mine. That's when her A1C started going down and now they stay there. The Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor is at the core of how I let go of that fear. Being able to see the direction and speed of Arden's blood sugar helped me to make better pre-bolusing decisions. It helped me to be more confident that my boluses were going to work. Gave me the, I guess, the, the kind of warm embrace of confidence. And it allows me to be bold with insulin. I really think you should go to Dexcom.com forward slash juicebox or click on the links in your show notes or at juiceboxpodcast.com to find out more. As the people are afraid of their insulin. And and caregivers are afraid of the insulin. Nurses, school nurses. Right, right. Um, you, you see it all the time. Everybody is. And it, it, it mm-hmm. makes sense in the moment, right? Like it's, I don't want to kill anyone. Makes sense. So I won't. But... Everything that comes now from that decision gets pushed off into the future, and our like our our people brains don't exactly worry about forty years from now, twenty years from now, ten years from now, five years from now. We don't think about things like that, you, you know. Like, and especially when you're being attacked in the moment, sometimes it's what's the best thing I can do right now. And I just felt so sad for people who didn't know that there were these other things you could do right now that would not only fix now, but fix later. And, and I just thought, so what's keeping me from saying this to people? Like, I, I should, y- y- you know, and, and more people should, by the way, but well, most don't. And I get it. Like, I've heard the, the, you know, like, well, everybody's diabetes isn't the same. And so I took that really seriously because it's true. But it's a thought that stems from 15 carbs for 15 minutes, like that thinking. Like, right, mm-hmm. like everybody's, everybody's looking for this mathematical perfection about how something gets adjusted. Every time I talk to somebody for the first time, they want to know, well, when this happens, how much do I bolus? And Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't know. I don't even know how much I'm going to bolus the next time that happens to my daughter. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to figure out how the insulin works. And as I keep thinking through the problem, now as as a listener to the podcast, you can hear the tenets that I hit on are just from thinking through not so much taking care of my daughter's diabetes, but how do I tell you about it? And, and I can't believe that any of that happened either. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, it, it, it certainly wasn't on purpose. Right. And then to hear someone like you come in and say, you found it, and this is all it's done for me. I mean, it, it would be, it would sound cheesy to say that it's humbling. Um, because my narcissism won't allow me to feel humble, but, but Vicky, but, but, you know, but, but no, seriously, like it, it's, it's, I don't feel like that. I don't, I'm not, I don't feel all like, Oh, that's so nice. What I feel like is I can't believe this happened. I can't believe it worked and we should do it more and other people should do it. And you guys should all put me out of business. Like you should make this podcast unnecessary. Mm-hmm. You, you know, like I want to see people struggle, get online, ask somebody, and instead of somebody responding with, well, that's just diabetes, which is what you thought, and which what everybody thinks, I right. want to hear somebody say, oh, that sucks. Here's what you need to do. Be bold. Right? right? And it was, it was very liberating for me to stop counting carbs. You know, forget the whole keto thing, but to stop counting carbs and just say, okay, 
what does this trend look like? What does it do when I eat chicken? And what, what do I just give myself a little insulin to make sure I don't do that little spike. Mm -hmm. And it, it, for me works so much better intuitively than the numbers. The numbers don't work for me. Well, even at that, if you stop and think of what people have told you, if you, if you're only going to bolus for carbs, then you never would consider bolusing when you ate chicken. Like never, right. it would never occur to you. Right. You would say, somebody told me this was free. My blood sugar must be getting high for a different reason. I'll wait three hours and see what happens. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. I, have no, I can't tell you that, that, you know, Arden's blood sugar moves and I'm like, uh, let's do something right now. Like right mm-hmm. now, like unless I'm in a situation where I'm like, this is going to stop or this is going to re I know it is. I might wait a little bit, but uh, you know, and it, and this aggressiveness becomes, here's why it becomes really interesting. So Arden's 13. She's clearly on her way to lady time. And so um, she needs more insulin all of a sudden. I just, two weeks ago, arbitrarily increased Arden's basal rates by 30%. I didn't tell a doctor. I didn't wait. To, her blood sugars were higher. So I said, okay, more insulin. And I'm still not sure I raised it high enough at some points. There's one spot in the day where I think it's a little too high and I'm going to crank it back a little bit. But there are other spots where it needs to be up again because I'm still bolusing for no reason. And so what happened? Who knows? She's more mature. Something's going on with her body. She's growing, blah, blah, blah. It's happening. But if I don't have that empowerment to do something about it, then I sit here for 90 days in a in a, in a pool of anxiety while she doesn't feel well going, well, when I get back to the doctor, I'll mention this to them and see what happens. And, and that's a horrible way to live. No one should live like that. Well, when, when I was diagnosed 18 years ago, um, I was able to have access to some pretty brilliant endocrinologists. Mm-hmm. And I went and talked to people. I talked to people who were on insulin pumps. And decided, okay, an insulin pump is the way to go. That's, I, I know that I need to have an insulin pump. Okay. My first endocrinologist visit, um, I, and again, this was 18 years ago, but I don't think much has changed. Um, my endocrinologist says to me that she thinks I would make a really great candidate for uh, an insulin pump. But she would like for me to wait six months to a year. And I'm like, <laughs> Why? Why? You know, well, you have your honeymoon period and, you know, I like for people to get used to taking shots and so they know what to do if something happens to the pump. And I said, look, I, I respect your opinion and I, I, if you can give me a really good medical reason, I may listen to it, but if you can't, I'm just going to go find another doctor that's going to put me on an insulin pump. And she goes, okay, let's order your pump. <laughs> and so six weeks after I was diagnosed, I was on a pump. Yeah. They need, now, your, they need your have... copay, Vicky. She's like, you're not going anywhere, lady. <laughs> <laughs> so I, now I did have a honeymoon period. It was frustrating, but it would have been frustrating with shots too. Yeah. And I have had times where my pump went out when I was traveling overseas and I had to give myself shots. It sucked, but I managed it. And I, you know, I'm not great at shots. I, I don't really, um, not the needle poke, just the, you know, how much insulin do I actually need? And do I need long acting? And so, so it, you know, I don't have that education behind me, but I figured it out. Yeah, so and I, I'm sorry, that's such a good point, right? Is that, is that, first of all, it's anxiety ridden one way or the other. It's not like without a pump's better than with a pump. It's all diabetes. It's just, you know, the pump gives you more tools. It gives you more freedom. It gives you more ability to make these small adjustments. But when when the pump stopped working on you, it wasn't like you just laid down in the road and was like, oh, I guess that's the end of my life. I'll just exactly. give, give right. up right now. My insulin pump right. stopped working. I get, Where's a train to throw myself in front of? It, it, you just right. went, oh, I guess I should figure out what to do with these needles now. And so, yeah. and so, and so in a world where you're going to wear that insulin pump most of your life, why should you wait a year? Because that year is so dangerous in other ways. Sure, you learn how to manage with MDI, but if it's not working for you, by the way, there are people who manage with MDI fine. This doesn't apply to them. Absolutely. But but if it's right. not working for you, this is a year of anxiety. This is a year of uncertainty. It's a year of bad health. It's a year of not feeling well. To what? So now I have the experience of what it's like to live crappy with my diabetes? Like, 
Right. Unbelie- like, what kind of common sense is that? It's not. It's just something someone said at some point that now we all just listen to for some reason. Yeah. And I was traveling internationally, so I knew that MDI was not going to work for me. I, I just, you know, with going across time zones and my schedule the way that it was, I just, I couldn't imagine that working for me. Okay. Well, it, I just, I think you, that's an incredibly brave thing you did back then even, because I'm just now speaking with somebody privately who said to me the other day, well, they want me to wait six months. And I said, well, just tell them you don't want to wait six months. And the response mm-hmm. back was, I can't do that. I was like, why not? Mm-hmm. And then she thought about it. She goes, oh, I guess I could. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, because it's your money, your insurance, your life. Like, why would you, why, why do you have to do what this person says to you about this one specific idea? Um, and, and, she, and, but, but it's I talk about it over and over again here. We are pre-wired to like, listen to certain people in our lives Doctors are. doctors are one of them. Nobody, mm-hmm. you never throw up a flag against the doctor. I mean, listen, I had my shoulder fixed a year ago. The guy's like, I'm going to cut your arm open. <laughs> I'm going to move these things here. I'm going to reshape this bone. And I went, okay. I really probably should have looked into it farther. <laughs> 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 I mean, be, but I wanted to believe him. Like, I, like, he does it. It works. He's done it before. Look, all these people that come in here. I should have looked closer at it. I mean, it worked out fine, but... The, the idea there, that overarching idea of, they he said it and I just went, hey, it's cool. You went to medical mm-hmm. school. You must know better than me, right? So let's do it. I uh, I recently went to a doctor who I had been dying to go see. He's a um, pretty well-known keto doctor. And um, I finally got in with him and we actually had a, a, a video, a meta conference. And... Um, he knew I was a type one and he said to me, I think that your basal rates are too high. I think you need to lo- lower your basal rates. And I said, okay, um, do you want to know what my basal rates are? And so I go to my pump and I rattle them off to him and he didn't ask me what my blood sugars was, were a certain time of day. Um, he didn't ask me uh, if, you know, I was getting a lot of lows. He didn't ask me if I was getting a lot of highs. He just said, yep, let's cut your basal rate. I want you to cut it by this much. I said, okay, let me wrap my head around this. You want me to cut my basal rate? So are you telling me you want me to run my blood sugar higher? No, no, no. I want it below 120. I don't understand that. Right. Because I don't give myself more insulin than I need. If I did, You'd be low. I would have low blood sugar. Right. So I think, you know, I think regardless of who you go to and... How you feel about, I, I think this doctor was brilliant, but when it comes to type 1 diabetes, I don't think he was. And what makes and him say I, that? Like, what made him just go, and, and to your to what we're talking about, it's this idea that, like, he's got a thought in his head. You know, it's, uh, this is how much your basil should be. A person your age, at your weight, your basil's too high. Based yeah. on based on no facts coming back from you. And this is a person exactly. you're thrilled to go see because of how well regarded they are. Exactly. And so what stopped you from listening? Because I'm assuming you didn't listen. Let me tell you a story about a day that I didn't listen to somebody's advice. Arden was four years old and we were getting her an insulin pump for the first time. And our doctor said, here, use this one. It's called the Animus Ping. And I said, well, what about that one over there? That little cool thing with no tubes on it. What's that called? She goes, that's the Omnipod. But you want an Animus Ping. I said, no, no. I want an Omnipod. That thing looks futuristic. In that moment, all I thought was the person or the company who designed that was thinking about comfort and ease and convenience. They were having a bigger picture idea of what an insulin pump should be. They didn't just say, hey, this is what insulin pumps look like, so we'll make an insulin pump that looks like everybody else's. They thought, what would make it better? They were thinking about the future. And I was right about that. It's been 10 years since I made that great decision, and I have not once regretted it. You know, in that time, Omnipod has redesigned their pump to be smaller. We were upgraded right along. Didn't have to pay money. Wasn't like, oh, my insurance company didn't say, no, you have to wait. Just Omnipod made an improvement, and I got the improvement. And the company is sticking with that today. Omnipod just found out that they got FDA clearance for their new PDM, the Dash, Now that's going to be the remote control that you use to talk to the pump. The next thing I hear from Omnipod, 
Dash is gonna be free. That's right. They're gonna get them manufactured over the next couple months, get them out to the public. You can just have it. You don't have to upgrade, you don't have to pay them anything. Isn't that something? How nice is it to be involved with a company who doesn't try to wring every nickel out of you? They just want you to have a great experience. Use your tubeless insulin pump, live a good life. If you go to myomnipod.com forward slash juice box or click on the links in your show notes or at juiceboxpodcast.com, Omnipod would be thrilled to send you a free, no obligation demo pod. You'll be able to hold it in your hand and wear it to see if it's going to be something that you would enjoy. I genuinely think that you will. Give it a try. And so what stopped you from listening? Because I'm assuming you didn't listen. No, because I want to keep my, I, I know my basal rates are good. I right, want to right, keep my right. blood sugar under 120. Yeah. <laughs> did you tell him to his face or did you do it? Did you not do it when you left the office? I'm interested. Uh, I did not tell him to his face. <laughs> I, to, I told him that I was really confused by what he was telling me, um, but he changed the subject. He didn't dive any further and I just let it go. It would have been great if he said, I really had no reason to say what I just said. I get bored. <laughs> Sometimes I just sit in here, this fluorescent light, it makes me crazy, and I just start spouting stuff off just to see if people will listen. The last yeah. woman who was in here, I told her to go home and ride an elephant for a half an hour. I wonder if she did that. It, it, maybe he's just he's lost his mind with the humming of the fluorescent lights and the white walls, and he's just like, I, I have to get out of here. So, oh maybe, if I, maybe if I kill a couple of these people, they'll fire me and I can get out of this job. <laughs> It's so oh god I'd love to I'd love to ask him what he did that for. That's fascinating. Yeah. But it's it's also such a great example because and it's it's partly the situation's fault, it's partly our fault for wanting simple answers. It's also it's partly their fault for wanting to give simple answers. And mm-hmm. the, there there are no well listen, I I have a simple answer. Let me give it to you. <clears throat> if your blood sugar's high, you've mistimed miscalculated or a combination of the both your insulin and probably need more. And if your blood sugar is mm-hmm. low, you've missed time, miscalculated or need less. That's pretty much right. it. It, it, it. That's exactly it. In the end, it's I'm driving in my car. I do, there's a tree ahead of me. I have to press on the brake a certain amount uh, so that I don't hit the tree. And at the same time, I don't stop the car so quickly that I flip it over. And so like, where is that spot in the middle? That's where I belong. And, I, and it's it, it's all about the balance between the carbs and, and the insulin and, and, you know, to some extent what your body is trying to do because your body's trying to lower and raise your blood sugar too. And so you just have to stay fluid because, because we, we have these ideas like, oh, I'll, I'll put in this basal rate and that'll work fine. I don't understand why my blood sugar got high. Well, we, your body doesn't regulate your insulin by putting it at one exact level and leaving it there for the rest of your life. It doesn't work that way. Why would you think this artificial thing would work that way? The answer is, if you thought about it, you wouldn't. But someone told you that it works like that. So you said, okay. And you moved on. And, uh, and you're not doing that. And so and that's amazing. I think, and I think that's what needs to change. You know, it, um, we've got to change the way we educate people about diabetes. And we do have to empower them. Yes. And I don't, know, I don't know how we do that other than... The Juice Box Podcast, but you know we've we've got to make a change. It's obvious that the podcast is the answer. So here's what I here's what I <laughs> here's what I thought. You know, I talked a little earlier about like the progress that I made bringing the podcast to light. I'm still thinking about it that way because here's what I have happening now. I meet people through the podcast who are unsure, struggling, new, looking for answers. Then they find their answers and they go back to their life, which is what they should do. But then what happens the next day is more people come, more newly newly diagnosed, more frustrated, fed up, et cetera, people show up again. And so I feel like there's a long road and I'm at one end of it and scattered across the road are nails and people drive over the nails, get to me, I fix their flat tire and they keep going. What I want to do is find a way to get the nails off the road Mm -hmm. and then I want to leave. I don't want to be here anymore. So, so how do, how do you, I keep thinking, how do I take what I've learned here? Because what we have to do is we have to go back to the people who make the road. And those are the, those are the doctors. 
And, and how do we talk doctors into believing that you can give people good, solid, easy to understand, easy to follow information in the beginning? Instead of telling them things like, well, in a year, you'll really understand these shots and then it'll be okay to have a pump. And, and because what they don't believe, what they don't understand is that that, those, that year, when they see you four times for 15 or 20 minutes, you are struggling and, and anxiety ridden and sad and sure that you are screwing this up. And you're not paying attention to all the things you should be paying attention to who would, that would teach you how to stop what's happening. They don't offer mm-hmm. you guidance. You don't have the wherewithal to pay attention to what's happening around you. No one's giving you any guidance whatsoever. How do we get the doctors to tell you on day one? Maybe they don't even know. Like maybe even if like, do you know what I mean? Like maybe even if they decided to tell you on day one, maybe they wouldn't tell you these simple things. Maybe they would tell you something else stupid that doesn't work. Um, well, but to it, me, that's and it what breaks I hope my about. heart. It, it breaks my heart to meet these new families that have been recently diagnosed. And maybe they've seen their endo one and they're like, well, I've got a list of questions because, you know, all these things came up and and I've got all these questions and I'm going to my doctor in two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I just think to myself, oh, I don't think you're going to get them all answered. I just we we need some kind of a system where when people have the question, they can get it answered right away because you're right. How can we wait 90 days? in order to take our health back. Yeah. Man, and it takes such a certain kind of person to... I was talking to Chris Freeman the other day. I'm actually going to put an interview up with him in a minute uh, this week, which will, to you, be three months ago, probably, uh, <laughs> if you're listening now. But he, he, he's such a certain kind of individual that, that he heard roadblocks, and he was just like... Pff, and he even says in the interview, he's like, part of it was just arrogance. I was just youthful, and I thought, you know, I'll do this. Do you know what I mean? And and plus yeah. it was him. So it wasn't like a loved one or a child. Like I, I get how it happens. Like I, you know, I don't want anything bad to happen to me. I really don't want anything bad to happen to my kids. And yeah. now I'm uncertain. I'm uneducated. I feel like someone hit me in the face with a shovel. This doctor told me do this. Now that all seems like a rule. And so now I'm like, okay. And now I start following these rules. The rules get me nowhere, which makes me think I'm not following them correctly. Then I feel terrible about that. And then it all compounds on itself. And then before you know it, I feel like I'm under a thousand pound blanket and I, and I don't know what to do. And, yeah. and by the time, and then I go back to the doctor and I'm like, uh, I have a question about my basal rates as if that's going to fix it. You, you, you know, it's just, it's such an imperfect system. But I do believe that the podcast has really made me believe from the, the feedback that I get, the private feedback I get from people. It has made me believe that people can handle knowing sooner what to do. And, and if it ends up being that you, Vicki, have one level of intellect and I have another level of intellect and the person across the street has a third level and we are not all nearly as bright as one another, maybe one of us won't get it. But that is not a good reason not to tell the other ones. Exactly. And, and that is really what we do right now is we just least common denominator everything so that no one gets left behind. And I've, I've said this a couple of times in the last few recordings, but it, it, it always feels like school to me. Like there's 20 kids in a room. Two of them are brilliant. 15 of them are average. And the rest of them are really, really, really below average. And then we don't want the kids at the bottom to fall behind. And we think that's okay because that seems human. It, it, it's humane, I guess, right? And I don't disagree with it. But what about the kids at the top who are like, this class is doing nothing for me? And the kids in the middle who could be going so much faster but aren't. Like, when did we decide who it was who was getting screwed? Like, do you, do you know what I mean? Like, like how, do, how, do you, how did you decide, how did doctors decide that health was going to get screwed in case a couple of people couldn't follow what they were saying? And, and, and we have to find a way to empower the people who can take the information and do something with it. And at the same time, help those people who would struggle more with it. And that's why this podcast is perfect because somehow I have some of the answers and yet I'm an idiot. So when I say it, it's very understandable by every level of humanity because I'm a dope, but at the same time, I know how to keep blood sugars online. So I think, I honestly think this is joking aside. That's what they have to do. They have to, oh. they have to hum- humanely and simply tell you something. I think the problem is they don't know. They don't have diabetes. They don't live with it. How would they know how to 
give you the tips and the tricks. And you know what I mean? Yeah. And even I've had a couple endocrinologists that do have diabetes and what they do doesn't necessarily work for me. Yeah. You know, who says they're good at it, by the way? Right. You admitted at the beginning that you had to take better care of yourself because you were worried about standing up in front of people and being a hypocrite talking to them about Mm -hmm. diabetes. Mm -hmm. How many of those people are like that? Or right. or have just been at it too long, or burned out in their own life, or whatever it ends up being. And it's hard to be excited when you're talking to them. The thing that keeps me motivated is I'm trying to help my daughter. If this was a podcast about how I took care of my diabetes, I'd be like, I ate cookies. It didn't go well. That would be <laughs> that would be the whole podcast. <laughs> so I'd be like, I don't know. Which, I was chasing that blood up, sugar all day. <laughs> yeah, which brings up another really good point. I think that um, there, you know, diabetes is very lonely. And especially if you have been diagnosed as an adult, you don't have that relationship with a caregiver that totally understands what you're going through. So there's few people in your life as an adult who's been diagnosed that really understand what you're going through. And although your family may want to, they don't really get it. Mm -hmm. Unless, Unless they were in your position where you're taking care of it day in and day out, you get it. When, when you're an adult and you get this, you don't have that, that person that you can go to. So it can be really, really lonely. Um, one of the things that we've done here in Phoenix is we've started an adult type one group. And there's probably about 50 people that follow us. We meet monthly. And it's really an opportunity for us to just get together and either just complain about our day or share our successes or... You know, sometimes we have somebody educational come in from Dexcom or Omnipod, and it's really been a lot of fun. And I would love to see more groups like that across, you know, the U.S. just embracing the type 1 adults because, let's face it, our kids grow up and type 1 doesn't go away. And they become adults and they become their own caregiver and and it gets lonely. Yeah. No, I can't imagine. I I have the ability to step away from it because in the end, I don't have diabetes, right? I can, at the end of the night, if Arden's had a really terrible day, when she goes upstairs to bed, I'm I'm where I am and I exist and I don't have diabetes. And, and mm-hmm. so there is a, a respite for me. I can escape. Um, she can't escape. And right. and it's it's just lost. It, it's lost on most people, the, the, the psychological aspect of it. It's um and 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 I think going back to what we said at the beginning, it is really nice to support those people. People do need to vent. They do need to be like, oh wow, this happens to you too. But more importantly, maybe we could eliminate a lot of that psychological pressure if they weren't spending their whole day um, looking at food and going, oh, I don't want to eat that because it's gonna make my blood sugar go high, and then I'm gonna have to give myself insulin, and then I'm gonna give myself insulin, and then it's gonna go low, and then I'm gonna get dizzy, and then I have to eat something, and then it's gonna happen again. If people weren't having to feel like that all day long, you know, it might be, it's diabetes is still going to suck. Could suck a lot less. Um, Mm -hmm. perhaps that's the title of this episode. Suck a lot less. (laughs) I don't know. It's hard to know. Uh, but, but, but no, you, you just make such a great point. I, I think that's amazing. I, I know that for me, I, I have a couple of events coming up where I'm going to be out talking to big groups and I'm really excited about them because it just, I, because, because, Facebook and this podcast, you know, there are people who are not online. There are people who are not comfortable doing this digitally and they get completely ignored. You know, there's, it's just, there are so many untouched people that need help. And it surprises me that, um, people that I've come across and said, Oh, you got to listen to this podcast. Some of them don't listen to podcasts, which is surprising, but it is true. Yeah, I don't know how it, it, it's just, it's, I just got a a text from a a girl today and she's like, I've been looking for support for so long. I don't know why it didn't occur to me that there'd be podcasts about diabetes, Yeah, but I, I I love it. And at the same time, do you have any idea how hard it is to explain to what a podcast is a certain person over a certain (laughs) age? 
you know, or sure. how, to, how to get it on their phone, how to listen to it. When do you really listen to it? I don't listen to you. You're a guy. Why would I listen to a guy through my phone? It, you know, like mm-hmm. I only watch, uh, I only watch famous people on television. Although if everything that's going on in the news continues happening, there'll be no one famous left to pay attention to because they've <laughs> all apparently sexually assaulted someone. So yeah. they, it's just entertainment's yeah, just going to yeah. go away. Podcast. It, it's insanely terrible, but yeah, it's like every time you turn around, you're like that guy, that guy, that guy, him. Well, yeah. that I get. <laughs> Him I didn't expect. It's just, it's like, right. how is, you know, I, I now think it's possible that everybody is terrible. <laughs> just, I know. It, but, but no, but seriously, like, is, this isn't something people think about as, like, as their entertainment people think about. Television, they want to see a movie, they're going to read a book. I mean, you know, a person over a certain age doesn't know what a podcast is. Right. And so, and, and, and then some people come on and they hear things. I like that when people come on and tell me, I learned something. It was so valuable. I went back and I told my endo, and I always say, "Don't tell your endo you learned something on a podcast. They're gonna think you're, you're gonna think you're insane." And, and and so I said, you know, to be like, "Hey, look what I figured out. What do you think of this? Don't don't tell them about me until you're pretty comfortable that they're not gonna like take your kid from you. Call Dyfus or something." Well, guys listening to his phone made some insulin decisions. I think he had to take his kid from him. Yeah, you know, like so. Um, it is really interesting. How do you find? Um, your old life because you were did we, did we say in the beginning you worked in pharma at, right before you were at the JDRF or did um, you not say that? I, I don't know that we said that but okay. I did. Okay. Yeah. So how do you find your old life versus your new life? Like did you do you enjoy this thing helping people as much as I do or uh, do you miss getting paid? <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> I'm assuming the JDRF doesn't pay like a pharma job, but, but, no, but, no. but, but, but how, how are you enjoying this part of it? Um, I, you know what? I love it. Um, this is a very much a passion for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it is, feels good to go to work every day and know that you're making a difference. Um, when I worked in pharma, it was quite interesting. They were, um, a big diabetes company mm-hmm. and, I would sit in these diabetes meetings and I would hear them talk about the patient and I would, I would hear them just say all these great things. And it hit me one day, Whoa, I'm the patient. That's Mm -hmm. me. And I never felt like the patient. I never felt like as an employee, I was, free to be a type one diabetic. Um, one day we got a memo and that said that they had found some sharps in a couple of the bathroom trash cans and, um, that we needed to go to employee health services and pick up a sharps container and keep it at our desk. Well, I'm pretty sure that it's, a law that they have to provide sharps containers in public restrooms. Mm-hmm. And so I mentioned this to the vice president who sent the memo out. And I said, I don't understand why a company like this isn't taking care of their own first. Why don't we have sharps containers in the bathrooms to make it convenient for us? Right. And um, about three months later, we had sharps containers in the restrooms. But I don't think there were so there were so many things that they didn't think of as these employees are our patients, too. Like even even having a focus group to say, what do you think of this new thing we're talking about? Would you use it? And that kind of stuff never happened. So for me to now be out of that and looking back, uh, it wasn't as clear to me until I got out and now I'm looking back and I feel, I feel very, um, very welcomed where I'm at right now. I can be who I am. Um, it's kind of fun that I'm the only type one in the office that when they hear my alarm go off, you know, they'll say, Oh my gosh, where are you at? What's your blood sugar? You know, and, and they're getting an education about it as well. It's cool. And it, it has been, it has been a lot of fun, but yeah, I, I couldn't be happier. And your Omnipod this- is shutting down in eight hours. Is that, it is. Was that, yes. is that what I just heard in the background? <laughs> I didn't know you were on an Omnipod until I heard that beeping. And I was like, oh, yeah, I think, I think I've only got set. like three hours Three left. hours left? But, yeah. <laughs> I'm right away. I'm like, I, I, I perked up like a dog. I was like, oh, we're going we're gonna to have to change the pod soon. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was annoying. I heard the beeping. I was like, okay, here's what we'll do. Um, 
<laughs> I've got a new pod filled already, by the way, Vicky. As soon as I heard it, I uh, <laughs> I'm already over here. Well, that's really cool. Um, we only have a couple minutes left, and um, and so I, you know, is there anything we missed that you wanted to talk about that I didn't get to? No, I think we covered it. You know, I just again, I um, I just want to thank you for what you do. Um, I do think that we need to get this out there more. Like you said, the more people that you can talk to, the more people that we can get the word out that people just, this is, this is a disease you have got to take ownership of. And while our doctors are there to help guide us along the way, they aren't making the final decisions. And that's something that I try to get across to my family, you know, as we're doing some of these 504s and going into the schools and helping educate. And I just think it's, so important. I couldn't agree more. I really couldn't. I, and I really appreciate you coming on and talking about it because uh, you have a, a really unique perspective as, um, you know, being an adult who was diagnosed plus being working for the JDRF now, having been in the private sector, you don't, you don't get that kind of mix all, all the time. Um, I think it's amazing how you, how you kind of chase down better health and how it all led to this. Like, that's always the thing that I wonder the most, like, how did you find this? Because I can only do so much to get out into the world. And I'm pretty sure that all the things I'm obsessively doing, trying to get more people to understand that the podcast exists so they can give it a try. I don't think I'm the one who's reaching the people. I think you guys are. So it's, yeah. it's, it's pretty yeah. cool. You know, thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Scott. Thank you, Vicki, for coming on the show and sharing your story. Thank you also to Omnipod and Dexcom for sponsoring this episode of the juice box podcast. Please go to the links in your show notes or at juiceboxpodcast.com to find out more about Dexcom and Omnipod. You can also type into your browser myomnipod.com forward slash juicebox or dexcom.com forward slash juicebox. At the end of the last episode, I told you that this episode was going to be with Sam, but then I realized I made a mistake. So you got Vicky, right? I think it was a winner. Sam, apparently I put out like 20 episodes ago and just I read it wrong. Sorry about that. But I'm undaunted. Now I'm going to try to tell you who's on next week. Okay. I think it's going to be John. I'm pretty sure it's John. If it's not John, then it'll be Colleen or Natalie. Could be Monica, Ryan, Emily, Alicia, Melinda, Mandy, Janae, Ella, Jess, Catherine, Ginger, Jen. A great episode about burnout. Might be with Ashley. Could be with Ryan. Could be with Susan. Could be with Elena. Could be with George, Mike, Lisa, Sam, another Sam, Aaron. Hmm. Turns out I have a lot of episodes coming up for you. I hope that makes you excited because it makes me excited to bring them to you. There'll be a new episode of the Juice Box Podcast every week for the rest of the year and beyond. Forever and ever and ever, as long as we need to do this podcast. It's going to be here.